Hello, my name is Dodie. Welcome to Denver Public Library's Winter of Reading Book Buzz 2024. I'll be going through roughly 30 titles today, and these are in order of publication date. So our first title, Bones and Honey, has been published in October, and we'll move through later titles to be published in March. The evocative prayers collected in Daniel Dulsky's Bones and Honey, a heathen prayer book, invite contemplation and transformation. Across 13 sections devoted to archetypes and corresponding themes, the bone which represents mourning, for example, a variety of prayers, rituals, and stories are shared. They address deep and personal needs, pains, and desires in language that is rich, evoking a sense of the primal and magical. It will resonate with anyone looking to soothe the wounds of modernity with eco-devotional language, spell work, and daily spiritual nourishment. The author speaks to the expanding movement of those returning to slow, simple living and cultivating an earth-inspired, sustainable existence. Bones and Honey fills the reader with world-shifting, world-building, and world-sustaining words. Dulsky's prose defies time, connecting the readers to the past, present, and future while anchoring it in our bodies. These words could be the much-needed medicine for our time. Every day something has tried to kill me and has failed, notes from Periracial America by Kim McLaren is a call to arms. And before you ask, let's hear from McLaren on what periracial means to her. Quote, what does periracial mean? It's a word I made up while casting about for a way to capture both the chronic nature of structural injustice and inequity of America and my own weariness. A way to label life under that particular tooth in the zipper of interlocking systems of oppression, bell hooks called imperialist, white, supremacist, capitalist, hetero, hetero patriarchy, end quote. McLaurin makes her points so vividly that they are difficult to replicate or describe without direct quotations, and her assured evocative prose is the kind only a gifted writer can achieve. The author's voice is strong, the mechanics of her arguments are always clear, and she demonstrates wisdom, craft, and un uncompromising ferocity throughout her observations. The fiction writer by Jillian Cantor has a storyline that is as meta as it gets. A fiction writer who published a retelling of Rebecca, titled Becky, is asked to write a novel about a rich man's grandmother who allegedly wrote Demare's Rebecca before she did. Henry Asheford is the owner of a national chain of superstores, think Walmart, and is the two-time winner of People's Sexiest Man Alive. When his wife dies tragically, he attempts to recreate her obsession with the novel Rebecca by hiring Olivia Fitzgerald, the author of Becky, to write the story. It's creepy, atmospheric, and set in Malibu, and there are multiple sparks flying. But at its heart, the fiction writer is about the publishing business, the foibles of it, how money corrupts, and trusting your own instincts. Watch for bestseller author name dropping. Great page turner, especially for fans of classic literature. Raiders of the Lost Heart by Joe Segura features a whip smart and capable female archeology, archeologist, Dr. Socorro Corey Meha who ends up on a dig that could be the find of a lifetime and ends up being forced to finally deal with the man, one man she hates the most, Dr. Ford Matthews. What could have been haunts her and him too. Corey spent much of her career trying to prove that there was more to her than her voluptuous body. And as a Latina female, she hasn't had all of the advantages as Ford who fits the mold in this male dominated world. These themes are relevant and realistic, and readers will find them very relatable. Unrequited love, love, lust, definitely builds the tension between them to dizzying heights and makes when they finally give in to their feelings so satisfying. Perfect for readers who enjoyed National Treasure, Fool's Gold, Indiana Jones, and Laura Croft. The Fairy Tale Life of Dorothy Gale by Virginia Contra may be a story inspired by The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, but this contemporary reimagining is all about stepping outside your comfort zone 
and finding the power you have that has actually been inside you all along. A heart, a brain, courage. This Dorothy, who goes by D, instead of leaving Kansas for a fantasy realm, goes to Ireland, the Emerald Isle, rather than the Emerald City. She's a trinity to earn her master's and finally finish her novel with classmates and mentors to help along the way. Some who may seem familiar. Tim, with scars from serving in the military. Sam, who sets his sights low, fearing rejection. Riti, afraid to tell her parents what she really wants out of life. And Dee's sister, Tony, who wants a different life and lives in her sister's shadow. This eclectic mix of companions becomes part of Dee's search for a true home. The author does a fine job of not only reimagining this well-loved and seemingly ageless tale, but also conveying the universal themes of love, loss, and the desire to realize a life well-lived while finding that elemental place called home. If you're itching for a bloody, action-packed, jailbreak thriller with a protagonist best thought of as an even angrier Jason Stratum, The Ascent by Adam Platinga is a book that needs to be on your to-read list. Kurt Argento lived his life as a Detroit cop by the code of protecting innocence from the sick, evil deeds mankind is capable of. When he steps in to protect a young girl from unspeakable horror, he goes up against a corrupt police officer in a small Missouri town. For his heroic deeds, he's put in a maximum security prison where Julie Wakefield, a grad student who happens to be the governor's daughter, is about to visit for a tour. That's when a malfunction in the security system releases a horde of prisoners pitting Argento against a ferocious bunch of inmates if he is to protect the innocents stuck inside hell on earth. This debut novel is a red-hot blast of crime and punishment and crackles with sly wit and a jaded authenticity that has been hard-earned by Plantinga's many years as a street cop. Amy Patwaka's the Parliament tells the story of Madigan Purdy, a chemist who's doing a favor for an old friend by teaching chemistry to a group of kids in the library, which is not something she usually does. In the middle of class, tens of thousands of owls descend on the library, attacking anyone who dares step outside the building. This fantasy thriller bounces back and forth between an all too familiar scene of children and adults sheltering in place and their distraction during this time of crisis a children's novel called The Silent Queen, giving this story in a story a princess vibe, princess bride vibe. Patwaka manages both a unique exploration of the effects of trauma, especially on children, and a thoroughly moving portrayal of the power of solidarity in the face of seemingly insurmountable obstacles, combined with a healthy dose of rage at the lack of care and effort on the part of the government to combat gun violence. The result is a suspenseful and gripping argument for change. Translated from Spanish, Nicholas Ferraro's My Favorite Scar is one of 2024's most highly anticipated thrillers. Setting off on a joyride across Argentina with her gangster father, Victor, seeking bloody revenge against the tattooed mercenary who killed Victor's best friend, 15-year-old Ambar wonders if her life could be different and if she'll survive long enough to find out. Booklist called this Paper Moon Meets Kill Bill. What could be more tempting? Ferraro smoothly combines elements of noir, road novel, and coming-of-age story, the last most prominently in the story's final section, significantly titled Ambar. The climactic violence is both in inevitable and devastating. This is a brisk, gritty crime yarn, less interested in flash than in dark authenticity. With Kate Kennedy's trademark style and vulnerability, one in a millennial on friendship, feelings, fangirls, and fitting in is sharp, hilarious, and heartwarming all at once. A deep dive personal account into the millennial zeitgeist, Kennedy starts off with a disclaimer that this account is her own experience and she's not here to represent all millennials. She tackles AOL Instant Messenger, purity culture, American Girl dolls, going out tops, Spice Girl feminism, 
her feelings about millennial motherhood, and more. Kate's laugh out loud asides and keen observations will have you nodding your head and maybe even tearing up. This book was meant for 90s babies who are now in their 30s but still love Lisa Frank and have a 90s playlist that they still shamelessly blast. Everyone who is gone is here. The United States, Central America, and the Making of a Crisis by Jonathan Blitzer is an odyssey of struggle and resilience. With astonishing nuance and detail, Blitzer tells an epic story about the people whose lives ebb and flow across the border, and in doing so, he delves into the heart of American life itself. The author goes back to the beginning, to the shadow, shadowy civil wars in El Salvador and Guatemala in the 1980s, to the American prison system in the 1990s and the policies of mass deportation that transformed local street criminals into international crime syndicates, to Honduras's brutal crackdown on crime in the 2000s, 2000s and the emergence of gangs across Central America and the United States. And then the Trump era, in which immigration became a vector of resurgent populism with mass internments, the order of the day. This vital and remarkable story has shaped the nation's turbulent politics and culture in countless ways and will almost certainly determine its future. Manuela Martin writes with deep affection of her little white house under red trees on stolen land in the western forest of Sonoma County in The Last Fire Season, a personal and pyro-natural history. Raised by hippie parents in Santa Cruz, Martin was eager to return to the landscape of her youth, but her adult perspective was more sobering than her child's eyes. She knew it was a matter of when, not if, destructive fires came to this land. She deals with the process of making it a home alongside her partner, Max, and reviews her obsessive checking of the weather and fire patterns, the ever-present go bag by the door, the effects of smoke and poor air quality on both the garden and her own lungs, and her neighbors' various responses to the wildfires of the early 2020s. Martin also pays tribute to the mesmerizing, sometimes cleansing, undeniably powerful nature of fire itself. It may be complicated and sometimes dangerous, but is worthy of respect and care like the land and the creatures it affects. The American Queen by Vanessa Miller follows a group of former slaves on a quest for freedom in a place they can call home. Based on a true story, formerly enslaved Luella Montgomery, alongside her husband, Reverend William, and fellow eman emancipated companions, emerges as a true visionary in leading her people to the Happy Land near Henderson, North Carolina. It embodied a one-for-all, all-for-one, edict in a family-oriented cooperative setting where all resources, work, and food was shared and money was pooled to support the needs of the greater community. They thrived for many years, but in the aftermath of the Civil War, things fell apart largely due to broken, bitter, and racist white Southerners defeated and impoverished. Over time, acreage was abandoned and lost for various reasons. Families relocated for work, non-payment of taxes, and legal challenges over deeds and disputes regarding black land ownership. Absolutely mesmerizing and brilliantly researched, readers will learn about a part of history they may have never heard of before. Mike Chen's A Quantum Love Story is a book that blends science and romance together to tell a story that is every bit as twisty and surprising as the quantum physics and time loops that make up the plot. The story is set in the year 2094 and follows Carter and Mariana, who become trapped in a time loop, repeat, repeating the same four days over and over again, following an incident at the facility where Carter works. Since they are the only two who remember each loop when it resets, it becomes up to them to find a way to break the cycle. One of the standout features of Chen's writing is, a, is his ability to craft relatable and believable characters. This time, he's raised the bar even further. Readers will fall in love with Mariana and Carter long before they fall for each other. Their quirks and habits, the subtlety of their nuances, their flaws and foibles, all add up to make them feel like more than just characters. 
the time, the themes are so well considered and readers will get to thinking about the nature of time. Is it a trap? Is it a gift? Is there freedom in the passing of a second? How do our relationships evolve without time? For anyone who's contemplated how our identity and relationships are affected by the march of days, weeks, months, and years, this is destined to give you plenty to think about. The Silver Scream meets the mob in A Murder in Hollywood, the untold story of Tinseltown's most shocking crime, a sensational true crime story of the murder of Lana Turner's lover in 1958. Author Casey Sherman does an excellent job of providing background on Turner and her initiation into the Hollywood studio scene, rising to become the best paid female actress at the height of her career. Though she was smart and successful in that career, her choice of men was terrible. Marrying because the studio and current culture required, she endured beatings, blackmail, psychological torture, threats to her mother and daughter with multiple men. Then Stoney, then Johnny Stompanato came into her life, connected to the Las Vegas and Los Angeles crime syndicates, and Lana's life becomes truly dangerous. When he is stabbed in her own home, the media goes wild, and everyone wonders, did Lana kill Johnny? Superb writing, great research, photos and ephemera included. I try to become American, but America is toxic. I try to become Mexican, but Mexico is toxic. Award-winning poet Jose Alvarez writes in Ars Poetica, a poem in his new collection, Promises of Gold, Promesas de Oro. By including a Spanish translation of the entire book, the author charts another course, transporting language back across the border. In a prefatory note, translators David Ruano characterizes his collaborative translation with Olivares as the experiences of a Mexican from Chicago turned into the Spanish of a Mexicano who lives in Mexico. It's a fascinating aspect of the collection, which works particularly well since the author peppers his own lyrics with Spanish. Instead of rigid stanzas or sentences, structural freedom is embraced. This freedom appears in the poem's contents as well, effortlessly moving back and forth between his experiences and his reflections. The poems are offered like stories to the reader, and if read aloud, one could imagine each as a story shared by a close friend during a casual conversation. This collection is a uniquely bilingual celebration of life in the mundane. Both the work and translations do an excellent job of capturing the essence of celebrating and appreciating life, despite its imperfections, for what it is. When 18-year-old Ron Kovic enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in 1964, he couldn't foresee that he would return from Vietnam paralyzed and in a wheelchair for life. His best-selling 1976 memoir, born on the 4th of July, became an anti-war classic and was adapted into an Oscar-winning film starring Tom Cruise as Kovic. His follow-up, Hurricane Street, chronicled his advocacy for Vietnam veterans' rights. In A Dangerous Country, an American elegy, Kovic completes his Vietnam trilogy, delving deep into his long and often agonizing journey home from war, an eventual, an eventual healing, forgiveness, and spiritual redemption. The first section consists of entries from a previously unpublished diary Kovac kept during his deployment. In these, he traces his dawning moral objection to the war and his struggles to overcome his guilt and pain. This is followed by a more straightforward memoir section that catalogs Kovic's ep- efforts to rebuild his life when he returned to the U.S., paralyzed from the waist down and tormented by depression and suicidal thoughts. While Kovic covers familiar territory, he does so with immediacy, embracing candor. An unnerving, odd, delightful menagerie of stories is housed in Jenna Rose Nethercott's 50 Beasts to Break Your Heart. Don't expect to find a collection of retreaded fairy tales or myths with a modern twist. The author has cultivated a collection of otherworldly tales all her own. 
Each story in this collection explores different facets of longing, love, and the inherent darkness within the human psyche. Nethercott masterfully crafts narratives that are as thought-provoking as they are unsettling, making the reader question the nature of monstrosity and desire. The variety of tales from the story of teenage girls uncovering the mysteries of a sinister roadside attraction to a zombie rooster solving a missing persons case demonstrates Nethercott's versatility and creativity as a storyteller. Is this horror or fantasy or a little of both? If you are the kind of reader who would sit and listen to a bog witch tell a fairy tale, or if you would run barefoot through a swamp looking for an adventure, or if you like things a little sapphic and a lot atmospheric, this is the book for you. This Disaster Loves You by Richard Roper is somewhat of a quest story intertwined with romance, philosophical musings, and humor. Brian's wife, Lily, disappeared almost seven years ago, leaving her grandfather's watch and a postcard. When he believes he finds her via social media in a TripAdvisor comment, Brian decides to shake off his sad ennui and try to find her. Interspliced with Brian's journey to find Lily is the story of their love, how it started, and the twists and turns that brought them to this moment. As Brian jumps from one destination to the next to find Lily, and the truth behind their story comes into focus, he comes back to life with the help of New Zealander Tess, Tess a sarcastic, kind, and surprising traveling companion. But in order to move forward, he'll need to decide, stay in the past, or take a chance on something unexpected. A heartfelt, moving, gripping look into love, grief, grief, and coming of age, Roper writes brilliantly complex and dynamic characters that you can't help but root for. Hamilton Nolan's The Hammer, Power, Inequality, and the Struggle for the Soul of Labor is a deeply reported look at the potential for the labor movement to fix America, how that could work, and why it's so hard. Organized labor has been in decline for decades, yet it sits today at a moment of enormous opportunity. In the wake of the pandemic, a highly visible wave of strikes and new organizing campaigns have driven the popularity of unions to historic highs. The hammer draws the line from forgotten workplaces in rural West Virginia to Washington Hall, Washington's halls of power and shows how labor solidarity can utterly transform American politics if it can first transform itself. The simmering battle inside of the labor movement over how to tap into its revolutionary potential or allow it to be squandered may determine the economic and social course of American life for years to come. First published in 1992, Ben Oakry's remarkable debut poetry collection, An African Elegy, plays with the mystique of the African continent, countering simplistic narratives of suffering that have been imposed on it with vibrant, nuanced portraits of their traditions and resilience. This moving collection of poems from the Booker Prize winning author finds strength and hope while reflecting on the complex issues that have plagued Africa. In the title poem, a speaker addresses all the people of Africa, telling them that in spite of their sufferings, they are beloved and that their glorious future will make their past troubles shine in a different light. One of Africa's greatest gifts, this poem suggests, is a culture built on a joy in life and a persistence faith, per persistent faith that pain can transform into beauty. An invaluable window into Okri's experiences as a Nigerian immigrant to the United Kingdom and as a writer discovering his calling, these poems speak to universal truths about love, injustice, and the search for meaning. The genre hopping stories in Gunflower, written over the last past two decades, offer invaluable insight into the obsessions that have compelled Australian author Laura Jean McKay to return to the page. She inhabits or blurs the lines between human and non-human consciousness. These imaginative endeavors are acts of empathy and transferal. In Those Last Days of Summer, readers inhabit the mind of a chicken in a factory farm, while King embodies the alpha mentality of a kangaroo as it fights for supremacy. 
an insect bite in flying rods causes a woman's metamorphosis into a giant mosquito. But amid these stories of animal impersonation, metamorphosis, and clever reversals lie deeply human portrayals of ordinary suffering. For a writer, one of the most attractive aspects of the short story is the opportunity it offers for experiment, and McKay's deployment of language is as exciting and as original as her manipulation of ideas. The stories in Gunflower are provocative, poetic, and vibrantly alive to contemporary concerns. The Korean smash hit, Welcome to the Hyunam Dong Bookstore by Wang ba Rom is now available for the first time in English. This book is an ode to book lovers and indie bookstores, but more than that, it is an ode to appreciating life in its plainest and simplest terms. Short, quick chapters offer insight to Yongju's life after a series of life struggles, particularly her marriage and career that have drained her both emotionally and mentally. She packs her bags and moves to a small residential neighborhood outside Seoul, where she opens the Hayu Nam Dong bookshop. Emotionally fragile and searching for meaning in life, she has a passion for books that brings other lost souls into her orbit, providing a collective catharsis for the ensemble of troubled characters. The Hayu Nam Dong bookshop becomes the place where they all learn how to truly live. This slice of life novel is for readers of Matt Haig's The Midnight Library and Gabrielle Zevin's The Storied Life of A.J. Fickery. Zenith Man, Death, Love, and Redemption in a Georgia Courtroom by McCracken Poston is the fascinating true story, sometimes humorous, sometimes heartbreaking, of an idealistic young lawyer determined to free an innocent neurodivergent man accused of murdering the wife no one knew he had. The author represented Alvin, the Zenith man, Ridley, in an eight-day trial in January 1999. Ridley's wife, Virginia, had been found dead in their home after not being seen in public for nearly three decades. Gradually, Poston had pieced together the full story behind Virginia and Alvin's curious marriage and her cause of death, which was completely overlooked by law enforcement. Calling on medical experts, testimony from Alvin himself, and a wealth of surprising evidence gleaned from Alvin's junk-strewn house, Poston pre presented a groundbreaking defense that allowed Alvin to return to his peculiar lifestyle, a free man. Dustin Kiskadon, the author of Blood and Lightning on Becoming a Tattooer, first struck on this concept as part of his dissertation. After becoming a worker, working tattooer and tattooing more than 400 strangers, he took his field notes and turned his auto-ethnographic account of that experience into this book. Kiskadon closely examines how the process of becoming a tattooer can shape a person's physical, mental, emotional, and moral life. His capti captivating account explores the challenges they face on the job including the crushing fear of making mistakes on someone else's body, the role of masculinity in evolving tattoo worlds, appropriate and inappropriate intimacy, and the task of navigating conversations about color and race. Written in an easygoing style, Kiskadon's narrative ends up as much a workplace memoir as an anthropological study, where the work being documented is both tattooing and ethno ethnography itself. Think of a town set among mountains and valleys. Now imagine if you went to the valley to the west, you'd be in the same town, but 20 years into the future. And if you went to the valley to the east, it would be 20 years in the past. And imagine these towns radiate infinitely in both directions. Odile Ozan is a quiet teenage girl resigned to living life on the margins until she is put forward as a candidate on her town's council. This council, however, doesn't deal with trifling matters like approving new street signs or settling zoning disputes. Instead, they resolve issues that affect the town's present, future, and even the past. Then one day, Odile spots two elderly visitors from across the border, the grieving parents of the boy she loves. Within this spectacular setting, 
The author explores heady and mind-expanding issues such as what exactly controls the unfolding of time? And are we bound to a single-minded linear passage? Can we reverse it or escape it? And are there doors for alternate choices? Recommended for readers who enjoy speculative fiction that is about more than just the action in the story. Part coming-of-age story, part indictment of the pharmaceutical industry, and part examination of how wealth corrupts, Rachel Lyons' Fruit of the Dead revolves around just barely 18-year-old Corey spending the summer after her senior year of high school as a counselor at a camp for rich kids. When she is plucked from the staff to nanny for Spencer and Fern on a private island where she has to sign a non-disclosure agreement, she thinks of it as an adventure of sorts. The kid's father, Rolo Picazzo, is the developer of Granadone, a feel-good drug that has addicted and killed endless people and is starting to feel the heat for it. Corey's mother has been running RIA for 20-some years, an NGO which has supposedly designed magic rice that actually fails to grow. When Corey's disappearance collides with Rhea's failure, Emer heads off to find her daughter no matter the consequences. There are, a very, there are a few very convenient coincidences that may leave readers groaning a bit, but still lead the story to a breathless conclusion. In the spirit of maybe you should talk to someone, psychotherapist and host of the self-help podcast, Disordered, Joshua Fletcher provides a candid, funny, and revealing look inside the mind of a therapist as he faces his own struggles while treating patients with anxiety disorders. And how does that make you feel? Everything you never wanted to know about therapy is structured around four client case studies. He details with care and compassion his client's nonlinear path to health and healing as he works with them to overcome their anxieties. Along the way, Joshua chronicles the voices in his own head that act both as a hindrance and a guide in his treatments. It turns vulnerable, honest, and funny and how does that make you feel offers surprising revelations about a little discussed profession and empowers readers to make educated decisions about their own mental health. Eric Blem, the award-winning author of the New York Times bestsellers Fearless and The Only Thing Worth Dying For, tells the life story of a legendary snowboarder, Craig Kelly, who died in the 2003 Duran Glacier Avalanche and also offers a definitive immersive account of snowboarding and the cultural movement that exploded around it. Kelly dropped out of college to train for competition, focusing on perfecting entire half-pipe runs and adding flourishes to stand out. In 1987, he swept the field of the Grand Prix of Snowboarding competition in Aspen. In 1988, for the second year in a row, he was named Freestyled World Champion and Overall World Champion. Kelly also aspired to join the Elite Association of Canadian Mountain Guides and was in the midst of training when the avalanche hit with cold, hard indifference and dragged him and 12 others into the icy blindness. Blam account recounts in gripping detail the terrifying disaster, the desperate rescue efforts, and the enduring investigations into the cause. Thank you for attending our Winter of Reading Book Buzz 2024. We look forward to you visiting us at Denver Public Library. You can always check our website for these titles and more at denverlibrary.org. There's also a link to all these titles below. Thank you.